I was going to be really dramatic there, so it was. Oh, that's disappointing. <laughs> Yay. I love my church. Now, that doesn't mean I think we're perfect. And certainly not everything close to it. But something doesn't have to be perfect for it to be loved. And one of the best ways people can express their love for their church is through service. To get involved, to become invested in the daily life of the church, to be a participant, not just a spectator. The volunteers here in the church are the absolute backbone of what we do here in Lockers because I could show up with the word, sure, but without the people who uh, serve in all the different capacities, whether it's the sound desk at the back or the musicians, the singers, whether it's the people who make sure that the chairs are put out, that the hall is clean, that the heat is on, people who show up and, and welcome people at the door. It all comes together to make church. For those who spent time preparing talks and lessons for campaigners and, 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 and youth quake, these all come together to make church. We would grant a hope if it wasn't for the volunteers. And that's why we want to pray for you this evening and why we want to support you this evening now. I have to underline that support is not financial. <laughs> As someone said, volunteers don't get paid, not because they're worthless, but because they're priceless. And so if you ever sort of complain, I should get paid for this, then I'll just say, no, no, you're priceless, okay? We, can, we couldn't possibly put any amount on you without offending you, so please, please don't ask to, to get paid. Volunteers are priceless, even if sometimes they're anonymous. You know, there's times wherever I rock up to the church and there's things that happen and I know that it's been done, I can see it's been done, I can recognise that it's been done, but I have no idea who's done it. And that's the way that person has wanted it to be. They wanted it just to come and do it without a fuss, without getting any song or dance or praise. They just do. It reminds me a lot of the feeding of the 5,000. Truth is, the Bible says, you know, says that there's 5,000 men most scholars would say, look, there's probably closer to 12,000 people by the time you factor in women and children. <coughs> and instead of sending them away, it was getting late. Jesus turns to his full-time workers and he says to them, listen, you give them something to eat. And putting it on you, come up with something and they came up with nothing. The full-time staff fell short. They came up empty. So they go into the crowd trying to scrounge what they can from people. And all they find is a little boy who gave his packed lunch for the cause. Now, I'm assuming he gave it willingly. I think the Bible story would read very differently if they bullied him or coerced him to give up his lunch against his will. But the Lord gave, uh, took what the boy gave and he fed everyone and came up with more leftovers than what they'd even began with. 12,000 people stuffed full now, I know in God's providence that he knew that the boy would be there and God knew that the boy would hand over his lunch. I know that God knew what was going to happen and how it was going to happen. But from a human <coughs> level, we're faced with a very simple reality that this story, this episode, that day would have been very different if he had decided to hold on to what he had for himself. If he had decided, but I need to make sure I've got mine. You know, he could have very easily said, look, you know, while I have these couple of loaves, a few fish, it's not going to make a dent in, 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 in all this big crowd. I'll hold on to mine. I'll make sure I'm okay. Everyone else will sort out themselves. But in giving it to the Lord, he becomes part of the most famous miracle in Christ's entire earthly ministry. And the thing is, we don't even know his name. We have no idea who he is. But I'm not promising you fame or fortune because you volunteer here in the church. In fact, I'll probably go the other way and guarantee that it doesn't happen because you're volunteering here in the church. 
But what I will say is this. You have no idea what God can do if you give what you have to him and let him use you. I don't think this kid ever thought his offering alone would be enough. But that's the thing about God. When you give it to him, he makes it enough. He can do something with it. And that's what we're going to pray for this, this evening. Now, look, I'm, I'm not going to embarrass people. I'm not going to sort of uh, get people to come up or, or, or do anything like that there. I, I've long given up trying to drag people up at the front here, okay? I know a lot of you are uncomfortable with it. So that, that's not the plan. The plan is to simply ask you to stand as we pray. As we pray for the volunteers, as we pray for the organisations, and we pray that God will use what we do this year for his glory. So can I ask you to stand, please? <clears throat> Father, thank you for every single volunteer. Regardless of how many roles they have, how people might measure their contribution, big or small, Lord, for every person who contributes to the life of this church, Lord, we want to thank you for them. Lord, our church is better, our church is richer because of their participation. Father, for campaigners meeting here tomorrow night, Lord, we pray that for every single leader there, for every single child that comes in through the door, Lord, they will see Christ in those volunteers. They will see the life of Christ and the beauty of Christ and the love of Christ and the joy of Christ coming through that they might be inspired and inquire about what it means to be a Christian like those leaders. To piece it together with the lessons and say, okay, well, I want that. If that's what it looks like, that's what I want. Lord, for Toddle in on Tuesday, for, for those conversations that happen over a cup of coffee, as we show that, that the little ones care, that, that we care about them, that they matter to us, Lord, we pray that that love and affection and genuine concern, Lord, rubs off on, on the parents and the child mentors that come in. Lord, we want them to know that they matter. Lord, we want them to know that there's no greater calling than, than to be a family and to raise your children. And that we want them to be part of this family. Lord, that you want them to be part of your family. So, Lord, we pray for those opportunities as we sit and as we talk and as we share. Lord, for our small group ministries, for those who have opened up their homes, for those who have volunteered their time to lead. Lord, we pray that as we come together to encourage one another, Lord, those will be times where we are blessed. Lord, even by simply opening up our homes, Lord, we will be blessed because of that willingness to say, Lord, I don't have very much in my hands, but I have a house, I have walls, I have seats. Lord, take it and use it for your glory. Lord, for, for youth quick, Lord, we thank you what you've been doing there on a, on a Friday night over the last few years. Lord, how you've breathed new life into it and, and it's buzzing and it's hiving and, and it's all a wee bit mental and that's fantastic. Lord, we pray, Lord, that as we see these young people coming in and away from maybe uh, different circumstances and different situations, Lord, to a place where it is safe, where it is a place where they can be themselves, it's a place where they can talk and ask questions. Lord, we pray, Lord, that you will use that team to nurture young men and women for you. Lord, for you, fellowship itself going through a period of new beginnings. Lord, we pray that each and every young person that comes in, Lord, will see the value in a life that's lived, not in the world, but in Christ. Lord, give the leaders there that vision and that passion and that energy and that zeal, Lord, that they might see it lived out in front of them. That Christianity isn't boring, but it is beautiful and precious and valuable and genuine. Lord, in a world of TikTok and Facebook and filters and all the rest of it, Lord, may they see something genuine. 
Lord, for the men's breakfast, for the ladies' breakfast, for the catering things, for the for the, uh, all the other attributes that come together, Lord, for our musicians and for our elders and for our deacons. Lord, the list goes on and on of people who take time out of their week to prepare and to come and to serve and to do and to, to be available. And Lord, we pray that over the coming days and weeks, and months. Lord, you will use this church to transform the, the village of Lockery's. Lord, to, to make real difference in the town of Newton Arts. Lord, in the whole peninsula. Lord, we pray, Lord, that our church, because of you, and because of you working through our volunteers, Lord, you would do something amazing and beautiful with our church. Lord, that it would soar, it would thrive. Lord, it would grow deeper in love with you. Lord, as we become worshippers first and workers second. Lord, that people all around us, Lord, would be drawn because they're seeing Christ being lifted up high. And so, Lord, we pray, fill us with a, a love for our church, a love for our Savior, a love for the lost that are around about us. And we pray, Lord, that as the nights get darker and maybe it's more tempting to stay in or to maybe skip a night or to skip a week, Lord, we pray that you would fill us with that desire and love that says, I get to go and do this. Because, Lord, while we are privileged to have this group of volunteers around us, Lord, we also recognize that the privilege is ours to serve you, to speak the name of Christ into broken homes, into broken relationships, into broken hearts, to be the person who welcomes someone at the door who's had a horrible week, to be the person who says, look, look let me take the kids down to the Bible class and you just sit and enjoy the word and that leads them to you and, and they're saved Lord. and I have them because someone had the heart to say, look, I, I, I can serve you, I can do this. So, Lord, we pray, use us for your glory, Lord. We've been talking about Elijah the last couple of weeks. Lord, about that availability and that, that desire to be used by you in private and in public. Lord, we pray, may that be our reality as we seek to shine for you. And we pray this in your name. Amen. 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 Thank you, folks. John, another song, please. If you could, if you turn your Bibles with me to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. So two teenage boys were having a chat one day and uh, they ended up talking about girls and talking about dating. And one said to the other, look, listen, actually, I have a cousin. She's pretty. She's smart. I'll set you up on a date for Saturday night. And the guy was like, no, 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 no. I, I don't do blind dates. No, thank you. And the guy said, look, honestly, no, genuinely, she, she's pretty, she's smart. I promise you'll like her. But if something happens that you don't happen to, to like or whatever, why don't you just do what I do? He said, well, what do you do? Well, what happens is when you go up to the door and she opens the door, if you take a look at her and go, mm, no, you're not really for me, what you should do is you should fake an asthma attack. Put your hand over your throat and just, <laughs> just do that and then you can get out of it. So his friend says, right, fine, okay, I'll go on this date with your cousin. And he goes up to the house, knocks the door, and well here, doesn't the most beautiful girl in the entire world open the door? She is stunning. And this teenage boy, well, he just near collapses in a puddle. Boy, it is love at first sight. And he goes to, to reach his hand out to her. And she reaches her hand out to his and goes, uh, 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 uh. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. Would you agree that the word love is perhaps an overused term in our culture? We throw the word around, it means so many different things. I can love my wife, I can love my children, I can love hamburgers, I can love football, I can love a certain colour. And it all comes under that word, love. 
Well, when I say I love my wife, it means I care about her, I wanna spend time with her, I want what's best for her. But when I say I love burgers, I don't care all that much about what happens to them. I don't want a personal relationship with them. I don't want what's best for burgers. I just want to use them for my own personal happiness and satisfaction. So when I say I love burgers, all I mean is that when I eat them, I enjoy them. But if I don't finish it, I can throw it out, I can give it to the dog, I don't really care. When a person says that they love you, how do they love you? Do they want what's best for you? Do they want to build you up? Because in reality, so many people say they love someone else, but it's really only for their own satisfaction. And once they're satisfied, once they're full, they're more than happy to throw the other person out. Say, no, nah, just moving on. Don't care, don't love you anymore. And so sometimes the next time somebody says, I love you, you have to ask yourself, is that a burger kind of a love? Or is that the real thing? Real love is profoundly tender, passionate, affection for another person, a warm, fuzzy feeling. Certainly that's one way of defining it. I suggest though that tonight we think, we start thinking about love as not so much a noun, but a verb. It is something that we do. It is something that we put into action. In fact, whenever we meet the word love for the very first time in the Bible, it appears in Genesis. And it's the Hebrew word, ahava. And the word is an act of doing. An act of doing. It is connected directly with action, obedience. The root of that word is to give, to give obedience to, to give adherence to, to give uh, uh, deference to. So now when you start thinking about biblical definition of love, it is something that is more interested in giving than taking. It's a verb, an act of doing. I am going to love you and you will see it, not just by my words, but by my actions. I'm going to love you. In the movie Fiddler on a Roof, came out in 1971, if you want to feel old, that's 51 years ago. <laughs> not, I'm not going to ask you if he remembers it or he doesn't. But it is, it's one of the great musicals. And uh, in one of the musical numbers, the patriarch turns to his wife and says, well, do you love me? I'm not, I'm not going to sing it, by the way, okay? And what he's wanting to hear is, oh yes, of course, I've got these warm fuzzy feeling in my heart for you. Oh, I swoon every time you walk into a room. But that's not the answer he gets. The answer that his wife gives to him is, well, listen, I've for 25 years, I've washed your clothes, I've cooked your dinners, I've cleaned the house, I've given you children, I've milked the cows. If that's not love, what is? Bingo. Love is an act of doing it is a verb love is willing to act on that emotion now in romans 12 from verse 9 to the end of the chapter it's summed up really with that word love it's all about love and paul is very practical especially in chapter 12 but but get this and especially in chapter 12 this is how practical paul is in the 13 verses from verse 9 to the end he gives us no less than 30, 3, 0, 30 commands, 30 exhortations, all about love. The very heart, the very motive of the Christian life. Now these 30 commands, they fall into about three areas. I only want to touch on one of them tonight. And we're not going to start breaking it all down into the 30 different subgroups. We're not going to do that. But I just want to talk about love in terms of family. Love in terms of the Christian family, the body of Christ, the church. And if you're interested, by the way, the other two categories that all these chapters fall into. Number two, you have then love of the family. And it goes into love in the midst of a hostile world. And then third, loving your enemies. When people are actively hostile towards you. That's the kind of progression of the chapter. But love in the family. Let's read it. From verse 9. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. 
hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honour. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. First thing I want you to see in verse 9 is that he begins with a statement about the quality of our love. He says, let it be genuine. Let it be authentic. The, the Greek word is uh, without hypocrisy. Is what he's saying. Like, let me give you a bit of a quiz, okay? I know you use your Bible nerds here. Your Bible students, we go deep into the word here in the church. So let me ask you, when he says love, what do you think the Greek word is that he's using? Agape. Agape. You see, a lot of you maybe know it. You're kind of going, oh, yeah, 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 I remember that word before. Yeah. Why is it important? Because up to this point, Paul has only ever used that word in terms of how God loves us. And now, all of a sudden, when we get to, to this chapter in Romans, he takes that term and he says, okay, that is the standard of love we have for one another in the church. That's the call. As God loves us, so we love each other. Why? Because God's love is the standard. Love as God loves. And so that in one sense, it's really very simple. As you, as you um, can see in our church, as you see them in our church, look, you love as God loves. That's the call. John 13 says the same. You know, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples. By the agape that you have for one another. By the love that you have for one another. That's the calling card of real Christian family. Love. Now, let's brush up on some of those Greek terms. Okay? Because you know how I said we, we have one word for love? I love my car. I love burgers. I love my football team. I love... My wife and children. We have the same word for so many different types of love. But in the Greek language, they kind of have several, and it falls under four main categories. The first is eros. Eros is the romantic kind of love. Erotic is where we get the word. It's never used in the New Testament. It's never used in the New Testament. The second word is philio. It is used in the New Testament. And it is, uh, comes from words in Philadelphia or philanthropy. It is a brotherly love, a concern for the people around about us, uh, a friendship, uh, a fondness for other people. Third word, storge. Oh, storage, not storage. Storge, S-T-O-R-G-E. Storge is a family love, a parent's love for a child, a child's love for a parent. It's a family connection. Where you can sort of hate them at one point, but you're not allowed, and no one else is allowed to say anything about them because you'll, you'll stand up for them. It's but then we have that fourth term that's used here, agape. It's as if the writers of the New Testament wanted to come up with a whole new category for love to describe God's love for us and the love that we should have for the people around us. And this is what they came up with, agape. So notice what he says in verse 9. Let love let agape be real, authentic, genuine, without hypocrisy. That word, ultimately, that word uh, hypocrisy or genuine means uh, don't be an actor on a stage. Don't be uh, putting on a performance. Don't be putting on a show. Rather, he says, let it be genuine. Love without a mask on. Not the kind of love where you're nice to somebody's face, but you're like, mm -hmm. That's fake love. That's wearing a mask. Church, the, the family of God should never become a stage that is filled with fake love. You hear some Christians and they'll say things like, oh, <laughs> yeah, I love them with a Christian love. And what that means is, I can't stand the guy, but I know I sound like a jerk for saying that. So I love him with a Christian love, as in, I, I, I honestly, I love them. I promise you. I'll I, just, just, yeah. And it's like that arm twisted up behind the back. But our love for one another should be genuine and not fake. Not just a performance. 
Matthew Henry said that hypocrisy is doing the devil's work in God's uniform. Hypocrisy is doing the devil's work in God's uniform. That's fake love. Let's have an example of it. Judas Iscariot, on the same night that he betrayed Jesus Christ for a couple of days, it's over, he met Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. And how did he greet our Savior? With a kiss. And it was something that Jesus commented on. He says, you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? This was a sign of affection. But in your heart, you didn't love, you didn't care. In fact, you were betraying me. Truth is, folks, I, I have far more respect for an uh, authentic atheist than a bogus believer. Let our love be without hypocrisy. Let's love one another with an authentic, genuine concern. But notice it's followed up by another command. Right after he says love, then he says, okay, abhor, hate strongly. Isn't it odd that when we're talking about love, there's also this command to hate? Love passionately, authentically, but also hate passionately and authentically. Why? Because they're part of the same deal. If you love justice, you're going to hate injustice. If you love the environment, you're going to hate pollution. If you love marriage, you'll hate adultery and so on and so on. You know, love and hate, they come together. And this is God's character. He hates evil. He hates unrighteousness, but he loves what is good. And he especially hates hypocrisy. He hates false religion because he loves genuine, authentic devotion. Remember in Isaiah 1? God is speaking to the people and they're coming to worship and they're bringing their sacrifices on the feast days and they're doing all this stuff and they're doing all this uh, religious activity and he says, but who's required that you trouble my courts like this? Bring no more vain oblation. Incense is an abomination to me. Your Sabbaths and your feast days, my soul hates. God says he hates when Christians put on a show, this performance, pretending that we really care. I think one of the biggest problems in the church is not intolerance, but rather the greatest problem is tolerance. Tolerance for evil. You know, people say, oh, well, Jeff, there's just so much around us. It's in every movie we see. It's in every conversation in work. And it's just, well, this is just how the world is. But you and I should still hate it. We're called to abhor that which is evil. Paul called out the church in Corinth for doing this because they were tolerant of immorality. He called out the Galatian church for the same thing, for, for their toleration of legalism. Jesus called out a church in, in Revelation in Thyatira. He says, I have this against you. You tolerate the woman Jezebel, who was immoral and misleading his servants into sexual immorality and eating food sacrificed to idols. Apparently in this church, there was a woman who was going around and she was a wee bit casual with her morals. <coughs> a wee bit sexually active and loose. And perhaps it was under the banner of grace and said, look, we're Christians. God has forgiven us. It doesn't matter. We're forgiven. We're going to heaven. Let's, let's enjoy it. Let's live it up. Sure, what harm will it do? But Jesus said, no, but this is the thing that I have against you. You, you, you tolerate this stuff when you shouldn't. You shouldn't tolerate evil in your life because it impacts your ability to love authentically. It stains fellowship. The love that we have in the body of Christ for each other, for the Lord. It brings something foreign into it then all of a sudden. It contaminates. It ruins it. In the very next verse speaking, this family lovely says, Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honour. I want to brag on you for a minute, okay? Um, some of this comes really natural to you as a church. 
something happens and some of these are there before any of their you know family members are there and you're there with the shopping you're there with pizzas you're there with flowers you're there with a couple of things you know with a lasagna a casserole whatever happens to be and you show up and you're there and it's like okay listen here this is for you <coughs> and it's not even a question of if I should do it. It's a case of how quick can I get to Mark C's so I can get the stuff? How quickly can I make that make that casserole so I can leave it up to him? How quickly can I do it? That's the only thought that's in your head. As you know, uh, all have got out of hospital this week. I was speaking to Janet yesterday and she was saying about how someone came with different things. She says, I could have strung them up. The amount of stuff that they brought, unbelievable. And it was just, it made an impact on her. And here's why I love it so much. Because there's times whenever I get worried and you get discouraged and, and you're struggling sometimes and you sort of think, are, are we losing that sense of love? Are we getting a wee bit impersonal? After COVID, we have, you know, society, we have this thing of, right, well, I'm just looking after myself. And as long as it's okay for me, everyone else can kind of just find their own path and they can find their own space. And whenever we had to socially distance and wear masks, we came in and we came out and we filtered in and we weren't really talking to each other. We weren't able to really love each other or to, at least as a verb, <coughs> love each other. But all these stories remind me that in the background, you are still doing it. That's awesome. Thank you for being a good church family. Now, have a look at verse 11. Because I see verse 11 as the motive for this love that we show to one another as we serve. Whenever Paul writes, don't be slothful in zeal, be firm in spirit, serve the Lord. That's the key. Because we are serving the Lord and that's the motive. It's him. It's about God. We want to please him and honor him and serve him. We're doing this for God. It's that love for him and service to him. It spills out in loving <coughs> others. And if we love God the way we ought to, if we're in awe of him the way we ought to be, then we love his family as well. And we will love each other. For all our flaws and for all the different opinions that we may have and all the different you know, quirks that people might have, the, the New Living Translation puts it like this. Love with enthusiasm. I love seeing enthusiastic Christians. I love it whenever we sing enthusiastically. I love it when we serve enthusiastically. I love hearing people when they're talking about whether it's getting involved in campaigners or youthquake or, 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 or toddler or whatever it happens to be and they're bouncing and going, I can't wait, it's been a great night, yes it was good and we're doing this and we're, I can't wait for it. That's brilliant. But sometimes if we're being honest, there's times whenever, and I've noticed it in my own life, that there are seasons when we come to Christ and we're excited and we're on fire and it's good and we're bubbling and it comes easy. We can't wait to pray, we can't wait to share, we can't wait to do any of that stuff. And then there's these other seasons where somewhere along the line, kind of the wind comes out of our seals. And it tends to happen in January, February time, more often than not. After that break of Christmas, the nights are dark, you know, you leave for work and it's dark, you, you know, it's dark at three o'clock and the idea of getting back out to church and the wind and the wet and the rain and the cold and the ice just goes, I'm not excited about going out tonight. I'm not excited about serving tonight. I'm not excited about getting out of my bed. That's why I love Luke 24. When Jesus speaks to the two guys on the road after the resurrection on the way to Emmaus, Jesus left and one of the guys said, turns to the other and he says, did not our hearts burn within us? And he spoke. I love that. Did not our hearts burn within us? When he spoke. When you hear from God, it's like, yes, I'm ready for it. I'm fired up again because I'm hearing from God. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to serve now, I know we live in a day and an age where we have lots of knowledge and lots of information on the internet. We carry it around in our pockets on our phones. But our passion should match our knowledge. I know that we can have a zeal for God, not according to knowledge, 
But I think it's bad to have knowledge without zeal as well. I know sometimes whenever we're talking to each other, going into unsafe family and friends or work colleagues, we get a little bit afraid because we don't want to come off as radical. We don't want to come off as one of those kind of crazy fanatics. We don't want to be that, that crazy Christian person. But I've always found it easier trying to cool down a fanatic than trying to heat up a corpse. You can always hold a thoroughbred back. But if you get a horse that's just plain lazy, it's hard to get that thing going. It's enthusiasm for God that should fuel our love for one another, for our ministries, for our service. And this is family love, and Paul draws this tight circle around about it. Love with an agape love. So here's what I want you to see. This first expression of love among God's people, among God's family. We've got to get this. Because even though we're not going to talk about it now, when Paul goes on to talk about loving in a hostile world, and then ultimately to love our enemies, that's going to be really hard when we can't even love one another authentically and, and genuinely. If we can't love the Christian family, if we can't love each other, if Christians can't get along with each other, how in the world are we going to make a difference out there? How are we going to make a positive impact in Lockery's or arts or our families or our work? So this is where it begins. Family love, love in the family. And that takes me, and with this we're closing, to John 15. And Jesus says, No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you, and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, that you that your fruit should abide, so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you, so that you will love one. See, if love truly is a verb, if love is the thing that anchors us in what we're doing and why we're doing it and how we're going to do it, then we need to take the last words of verse 17 very seriously. These commands are given so that we might agape one another. These commands are given so that it might be possible, that it might happen. So maybe you're struggling with the idea of, of the, the new season ahead. Maybe already there's been a few rough bumps along the way. But the reason isn't necessarily because you're not saved or anything kind of radical like that. Maybe the problem is you're still thinking of yourself as a servant and not a friend of God. You're still thinking of yourself as someone who, who is told to go and to do and you don't have a say in the thing. But Jesus said, no, I consider you a friend. I want you in on this, ownership of it, a steward. I want you to be part of this, take ownership of this with me. Can I quickly fire through a couple of the differences between what a servant does and how a steward uh, behaves? And for those who are serving as volunteers, I, I pray this maybe helps us get, get us into the right mindset to think about, well, what does that look like practically? Number one, a servant lives in a room, but a steward lives in the house. Let, let me explain that. If you go back to when you were a student, or maybe you just moved out of home and, and there was a couple of you all living in a house together, normally you find out very quickly that the people you lived with were pigs animals all right absolutely disgusting all right it was a disaster and so very quickly the mindset was well my room is tidy my wee bit is fine i don't care what's happening to the rest of it my dishes are done my room is tidy my bits are done i don't care if the rest of the place is falling apart around me my room is done it's my wee bit my wee corner i don't care about anyone else however a steward will be interested in the whole house see whenever i live in a house and, and the people around me just aren't other servants, but are our family. Then you pitch in. 
So whether it's my turn to put the bins out or not, I'm going to put the bins out because I want the whole house to thrive because I see it happening. I'll empty the dishwasher. I'll, I'll contribute not just to my room, but to everyone's room because I want the house to go well. The house of God to thrive. So I'm not just going to stick to my little corner, but my heart goes for ev every part of the house. Next, a servant will say, I have to. A steward says, I get to. One says, ah, it's fine. I'll do it if I have to, I suppose. But a steward will say, I can't wait to Friday night. I can't wait to get to Tuesday morning. I can't wait to, I, I can serve and I can lead worship. I can't wait to me being the person who gets the chance to do that. I can't believe I get to do this. Next one, a servant will arrive late and leave early. They'll do the least that they can get away with doing. Like how little time do I have to give so I get the tick in the box? But a steward will come along and say, and will, will come early and will leave late. It's like they want to make sure everything is good and set up before they arrive. They want to make sure that nothing is left to chance. They want to make sure that if anyone else is struggling, they can be there to help them out and make sure that all the, everything is in place. And they don't want to leave. They'll not leave until they very much have to because there might be an opportunity to talk to someone. There might be an opportunity to talk to a parent or to share or to pray or to share the gospel. And so listen, I'm not going to be in a rush away because I get to be here for this moment to serve these people. I get to. What about this one? A servant's priority is to remember or is not a priority to remember. But a steward will make it a priority to be reliable. See, if someone is a servant, you have to keep reminding them that it's their turn on the road. And you might have to text them the morning off or, or, or the day before. It's like, I bet you they've forgotten. Bet you they're going to come up with an excuse. Or bet you, we see, there's going to be a text coming through. Oh, I can't make it. Oh, there's something to come up. That's a servant. It's like, Ugh. Because there might be times where they don't weigh in. Or uh, I know it's happening on a Friday night, but there's other stuff happening. There's a party happening. My friends are getting together. There's a few people. I'm, I'd rather do that. Oh, I can't make it. I can't make it to Edith Quick. I can't make it to, to campaigners. I've got, there's something else came up. I'm going to go to that instead. That's a servant. But a steward is determined to be reliable. And look, I, I know no one can be 100%. That, that's not what this is about. It's not about being 100% attempts. That, that's not physically possible. But this is a desire to be here. A desire because you know that it's important. You know that it's important. The work that's happening here is important and you care about the work that's happening here. You care about the kids that are coming, the parents that are coming here, the, the, the strangers who are coming here. You care and it's important. So you want to make sure that this house thrives I'm going to be here. I'm going to make sure I get my part done. Because here's the thing about priorities. Priorities reflect value. If the truth is that you'd rather get out of it so you could lie in bed a wee bit longer, that says, well, you value lying in bed more than serving God. Your love can't be that authentic or that genuine. A servant's priorities prioritizes other things because they don't value the work. But a steward will see the value in what's happening. What about this one? A servant <coughs> will say, um, will say, I attend. But a steward will say, I belong. They might say something like, well, the boss is unfair. Oh, that's one of the other screen. Servant will say something like, well, look, the leadership are unfair. They're asking too much of me. It's not fair that I have to keep doing all this stuff. Maybe they'll say, Jeff, you're being unreasonable by kind of categorizing like this. It's not fair. But a steward will say, it's a privilege to be entrusted with this responsibility. 
the reality is that in, in our church there, there might be times whenever you get asked to step in for someone last minute because people will get sick something will genuinely come up and they can't physically make it and you're asked to step in the temptation might be to say oh that's so unfair why do they always ask me why is it always falling on me why you know and then you can criticize the elders and you can criticize the deacons well they should be the ones stepping in they should be the ones doing it why is it always me and you know what you might even have a valid point there maybe it should be the elders stepping maybe it should be the deacons stepping in and not you but a steward's response will say okay wow you ask me to do this thing you, you trust me with this to step in at the last minute and pull something together and to make it happen you trust me to do this thank you for that privilege for that uh, respect and when leadership comes under fire you'll stand up for it not because we're perfect not because we have it right but because you'll defend the house because you want the house to thrive you want the house to be unified you want the house to be together you're a steward you have an ownership in this a servant will value opportunity over relationships in other words if another church is a wee bit bigger, another wee, a wee bit shinier, and maybe offering a, a better role in some organization, you go, okay, well, that's where I'm going. Because I'd rather serve there than here. Because they've got more resources, they've got a bigger crowd, they've got a bigger youth, they've got a bigger band, they've got a bigger whatever it happens to be. And so, so I'm going to go there. But the thing is, that's prioritizing opportunity over the relationships here. Because we're not saying this church is the biggest or the best or has it all together. But what we're saying is this is a family. And so we ask you to come and to serve, not because you think we're the best, but because you care about the people around about you. Because the people matter. And a steward will know that. A steward will value the relationships over the opportunities. Because we're family and you're looking around the people that you love and you care about. Last one. A servant demands to be valued, but a steward will desire to add value. A servant wants to come in and have a fuss made over them. Look what I did. Where's the appreciation? Where's the love? Where's where's the kind of the, the appreciation that I should get? And look, honestly, there, there can be seasons in life whenever you need people to make a fuss over you. You need that wee bit of encouragement. You need that wee bit of care. You need that wee bit of love. But sometimes, just like when a person gets a new job, okay, the first day, the first couple of days, you say to them, so how's the job going? Oh, it's brilliant, it's the best thing ever, I love it. It's brilliant, the people, you know, they really value my opinion, they're asking if I'm okay, they're checking in with me, they're, they're making a real fuss. And then you maybe ask them six months later, say, so how's the job going? Eh, it's all right. It's okay. It's not as good as what I thought it was going to be. They don't really just make a bigger fuss as they used to. Someone else came and started there, and all the fuss went on to them, and they're all talking about them, and nobody asked me. <clears throat> but a steward isn't interested in getting credit. His love is more interested in giving than taking. And so they will come to church, they will come to campaigners, they will come to puddle, and they will come to the men's breakfast or the ladies' breakfast. And the attitude isn't, who can make a fuss over me? The, the focus and the question on their mind is, who can I go and make a fuss over? Who can I go and bless? Who can I go and be encouraged with to? Who can I help today? Because I love them. And I want the house to thrive. I want the church to grow. So when it comes to John 15, May we serve as friends of God, not simply servants. May our love be authentic and genuine. When we give what little we may have, just like the feeding of the 5,000, God will meet the need. God will do the rest. We can trust him in that. We're going to hand back over to, to John and the team now. Let me just pray and then we'll uh, hand over to them. Father in heaven, 
We thank you so much for all that you do in the church, Lord. We pray, the Lord, as we go forward into the winter months and into the new year and all that will happen, Lord, we pray that the love of the church between one and each other will be authentic, Lord, that the world will be able to look at us and say, wow, behold how they love one another. It's real there. It's genuine there. It's authentic there. And Lord, we pray that that be the experience of every child, every parent, every grandparent, every stranger, every addict, every sinner, every saint that comes in through the doors of this church. That as we share and as, as an overflow of our love and our devotion to you, Lord, they would know without a doubt that they matter, that they are loved, that they are important. Because that's what stewards do. We pray, Lord, in your name. Amen.